morning, everyone, and welcome to the uh, Collaborative Black Health Summit. I am Yolanda Gauthier, and I am the Senior Living Health and Wellness Navigator for the Center for African American Health. We are so happy this morning to have just something that I never expected at a health summit, and that is this lovely collaborative of artists who are taking things that they do with a passion for all that they love and that they want to share with others. And um, our title for this segment is Mending Our Frayed Mental Health and Reestablishing Social Connection, Connections. Excuse me. Lessons Learned from Our Fiber Artist Communities. So before we begin, just a couple of housekeeping bits you will be able to see and ask questions in the chat. And if you want to speak, just know that you are on mute and the best way to do that will be through the chat. We have someone who will be monitoring the chat. And so whatever questions you have, just put those there and whatever greetings you have for our individual artists or our collective panel, please put that information in as well. So I am going to open it up this morning um, with Karen Berdier, and um, she will really be able to tell you why she thought this was important for us to know. So Karen, take it away. Thank you, Yolanda. And I'm going to start sharing my screen. Good morning, everyone. Good morning, good morning. So delighted to be with you this morning. You know that the 2020 pandemic highlighted the fact that our social fabric actually had some holes in it and it actually had some tears in it. And this has disproportionately impacted people of color. Shutdowns, confinement and more hits us all hard, especially with the loss of our regular routines, rituals, and the ability to be with our family and friends. That's why we're here to find out ways to reconnect during the pandemic too. Mending our frayed mental health and reestablishing our social connections, lessons learned from our fiber artist community. You know, we felt it in our bones in 2020. We discovered what really matters in our lives. Our ancestors conquered visible and invisible enemies we too will conquer these faceless invaders that have robbed us of our daily routines, sense of safety and well-being. Going into battle, they had tools, we have tools too. What we can do to regain a sense of balance, enjoyment and connect to our community. Get ready to energize your creative spirit and mental health through storytelling and fiber arts. Also called making. The fiber artists today represent several media they will share how their passion for fiber arts connects them to their communities, plus how it has sustained them through the pandemic by providing an outlet that they could, that can be shared. We hope that through our discussion, you're able to explore how these activities connect us with our ancestors through storytelling, as well as how you can become part of this ancestral fabric through making. As Yolanda mentioned, I'm Karen Verdier. I'm the Community Outreach Coordinator for Lutheran Family Services. I'm the facilitator, as she mentioned, for the panel as we go forward. Just a little bit about Lutheran Family Service Colorado Spirit Wellness Program. We're a short-term program that provides community members with resources and skills to support their emotional well-being in response to COVID-19. Coloradans can reach out to our team or one of our other 21 statewide organizations for free and confidential support through listening sessions and connections to resources. This program happens to be specific to Colorado, but if you live outside of Colorado, please check with your local health department because this program is actually available in 28 other states as well as the District of Columbia. We're putting the content warning up, and this is just because we're gonna be talking about some issues that could be upsetting to folks. So we want you to know that we have some resources that will appear throughout 
as well as this hotline number that we actually have here. For Colorado, if you need services, if they're, they're available, pardon me, 24 hours a day, the number is 1-844-493-8255 or nationwide, call one or text 1-800-985-5990. What are the benefits of fiber arts? According to a 2013 Cockle, Mary, Miley and Riley research study, they found that knitting, for example, has shown to promote higher cognitive and mental functions, improve social content and communication with others, feeling happier and relieving stress and helps you build self-esteem as a result of doing projects. Wow, COVID-19 really just turned our world upside down. And it seems 2021 may continue to also be a game changer for us all. Let's acknowledge that fact and use it as a source of strength and resilience. We have already conquered more than we even thought possible a year ago. Who would have thought we would have been sitting here doing this particular event, which is always in person for two days during Zoom, but yet we're here and we're doing it. Yes, our social fabric, has had holes punched into it by COVID-19, but we have the capacity to not only patch those holes, but create a bigger, better, stronger fabric going forward. As Cicely Tyson famously said, challenges make you discover things about yourself that you really never knew. We are going to be taking a couple of polls this morning, and this just happens to be one of them. So if you all could load up the polls for me. Thank you. If you would just take a moment to look at this. Um, how are you feeling this morning as an example? Number one is I'm feeling good and I have the capacity to share my gifts and do what I love and express myself. Or number six is kind of like I'm feeling burnt out. And in between, it's like, you know, I'm fine on the outside. But I could still need, you know, to do a little mending. Or I'm struggling with lots of problems and don't know where to begin. I'd like to give you a moment to, if you would like to fill this out, and it's totally anonymous. If everyone has finished, we can see the results of the polls, please. Hey, I love it. Well, I see we have a lot of people feeling ones. They're really rocking it this morning, up to three. That I'm looking good on the outside, but I still have some pieces I mandate. I really get that this morning because I live, I live in the foothills and it started snowing. So my pieces were good, but I had to go to plan B. So we are hoping that as a result of our conversation this morning, we're hoping to move you a little bit, even if it's not from a solid three down to a two, but somewhere in between. Thank you for the poll. Slight technology issue. Diane, can you advance the screen? Because the poll seems to have frozen me out. Thank you all for your patience. Anything? There we go. Perfect. Ah, 2020 taught us how interdependent we are and our need for each other. We miss our hugs. We miss sharing coffee and much, much more. 
we will get there again. But first, let's talk briefly about what we have learned first and foremost. A person's an island. Let's build upon that theme. We do need each other. So how can we make this happen in 2021? Understanding and valuing our social and emotional connections will help us all regain our strength and strengthen those around us. Just a little bit of definitions that fiber arts is sometimes called making and some of us call it crafts. For the sake of this discussion, we're going to be using those two terms, fiber arts and making interchangeably. So fiber art is a style of fine art which uses textiles such as fabric, yarn and natural and or synthetic fibers. It focuses on the materials and on the manual labor involved as part of the significance. I know you all have been very patient with me and I am so excited that I have the pleasure of introducing our panelists who will provide insight into their art and it has and how it has made, excuse me, and how it has been fundamental to their personal growth. It has strengthened them during these times. I'm going to introduce them one by one just to spotlight them because they have a lot to share with us this morning. And so, Kiona, will you join us, please? Yes, hello. Um, would you like me to do my introduction? You are on, the stage okay. is yours. I appreciate that. Um, I am Kiana, she, her pronouns, and I'm so excited to come here today, uh, partially because I never come by myself. So I represent the Yarn Mission, um, which is a knitting collective, a making collective that knits for Black liberation. And we started in 2016 after the murder of Mike Brown. Um, and we, sorry, 2014, my bad. Um, after the murder of Mike Brown and we, um, teach people how to knit. We bring people into community. Um, we are firmly planted in three tenets, which is to be intentionally, deliberately, and relentlessly pro-Black. We are um, pro-rebellion, so we support folks doing anti-oppressive work wherever they are. And we are pro-community and in the ways that it can mean um, being together, responding together, reflecting together, and building together. And so, um, I'm always excited to bring the yarn mission into other spaces and connecting fiber arts with healing and community is firmly a part of what the yarn mission is um, and therefore what I'm about. Um, I want to um, share a little bit though as well about maybe my personal journey, um, why the yarn mission resonates and why I co-founded the yarn mission. Um, I found that as I, um, I mean, I, I learned how to uh, crochet when I was itty bitty, right? At uh, seven or so, I didn't know, my mom taught me. And then uh, when I went to college, she gave me a book and it was something like learn how to knit in a day. So I always say, you know, I essentially sat down and I learned how to knit in a day. Um, and eventually I recognized that uh, being able to do that in community was important. I was in St. Louis and so I went to um, a local yarn shop and in that yarn shop I then felt comfortable pushing myself into different realms of knitting. Fast forward, um, Mike Brown is murdered and folks are out, right? Uh, the uprising has started, folks are grieving together, building spaces together, um, and requesting more together. And so as I moved through spaces, demonstrations, protests, um, organizing meetings, I knit everywhere I went. Uh, it was a way for me to ground into spaces. And I found that folks were kind of like, ooh, I'd like to learn how to do that. That seems like that would be a nice thing. And you know, you don't, you don't tell people right away that it also, you know, can take a little work. It might be a little challenging. Um, but uh, eventually my co-founder, um, Taylor, and I resolved that this was something we could do. And so essentially we began by just, I invited her and about six other people 
and I taught them how to knit. I brought supplies, we learned, we knit together and we went from there and um, we've grown organically over time and we look very different than we did and still carry very similar values and remember where we came from. So I'm excited to be part of this conversation. Oh, thank you, Kiana. That's really, I've had the opportunity of speaking with all our artists independently and every time I learn something new, so thank you. Tell me more, um, how did you really, it, how did you get the group together? I mean, we all have friends, but sometimes it's like people don't have enough friends for a group. <laughs> they don't necessarily want to all go knit with you. How, how did that process work for you? Uh, I always, uh, like, while we're, uh, the Yarn Mission is obviously founded in, like, values, right? We're about building spaces and being able to share space. And we initially, one of our initial things was being able to share space outside of the streets, um, right? In a space where we would maybe have more capacity to dream together, um, rather than kind of responding to the immediate threats um, and such. Uh, and so, but my kind of, like, side objective is like, I built a community of folks that will knit with me, right? Um, and then connected with other communities that is that, that existed. And so, um, you know, I, when I think about folks wanting to find community and fiber, um, and the fact that, you know, in some places it can seem sparse, I'm like, we also can um, try to con create those spaces that we need. Um, and so for me, it actually wasn't super challenging. I, there were a lot of people who had seen me knit and expressed an interest. And I just said, hey, join me. And the kind of typical barriers that would exist, I'm like, okay, well, I have an understanding of what's out there and I can use the resources that I have to make sure that I can make this accessible for people to come in. And then we can sit down and I can teach you the way in, right? Like I can teach you how to cast on and I can teach you how to do your knit stitches and we can go from there. And so um, it was really, I really just opened a space and invited folks and folks came and folks come <laughs> um, as we do this. And how are you now with COVID? How are you knowing that we're not really getting out as much anymore? How are you inviting people into your space now? So definitely a lot of adaptations. Another huge thing that we've um, learned over time is just to gauge our capacity regardless. And so the ways that we engage and interact just shifts over time according to the capacity of our individuals, but also um, just our collective kind of capacity, right? So um, this means that we didn't shift into like, oh my goodness, we need to be doing the exact same things we were doing before, but do them now, right? Like these are challenging times and it's nice to be connected. Um, but we do have our folks that um, will, we meet regularly on Zoom and do knitting together. We think about different ways that we can kind of re get into our redistribution of resources, which is a huge part of what we do. Um, folks uh, donate stuff to us and we share it out. Um, and so it's kind of still in the process of adapting, but also using the resources that we do have using the community building that we began before in the before times. Wonderful. Now I was going to go to the next spotlight, but would you like to share anything else specific? I know we're going to all come back together. I'll be here. I'm excited. I'll, uh, <laughs> thank you so much. Mary, I'm coming to visit. Yeah. Hi, everybody. Good, I hope good morning, Mary. This is a great day for each of you. I am Mary Lassiter. I'm a quilter and fiber artist here in Denver, Colorado. Um, I have been fascinated with quilts since I took a home ec class in high school. I had a wonderful teacher who not only taught clothing construction, but she taught me about how to use up scraps. Oh, I went to making everything from footstools to dolls to pillows to aprons. There's something about cloth that excites me. I, they don't want me to go to the fabric store by myself because I'll come out there with bags of things. And I just love creating. Um, the picture that you see on the left upper of your screen is one of the Black History Month functions that I did telling stories about my quilts. Those are my quilts over there as well. And 
Um, after learning about quilting, I didn't really do any quilting till the early 90s, I should say. Um, my first quilt was one for my daughter out of some of her clothing from when she was a little girl that, that she had outgrown. And after that, it just took off. I love quilting and I like different aspects of quilting, storytelling in quilting, the construction of the quilting, the inspiration that I get from my heart and my soul that I want to tell somebody about through quilting. I also love teaching the quilting. And during the pandemic, you know, I felt so isolated and alone, even though I was blessed to have my immediate family with me under the same roof, I was really missing my extended family, you know, brothers, my sister, and etc. But the quilting, since I have developed this practice of quilting, brought me a lot of comfort through the pandemic. We all are gonna have things in our lives that may affect us. And it doesn't even have to be about a quarantine. But when you find something that you really love to do with your hands, it's something very, very special. I know with Kiana, with me, I like to travel with something to do with my hands. Um, for instance, right now at this spot, even though this is a bag of yo-yos. Even when I'm on Zoom, if I'm not speaking, I'm doing something with my hands that has to do with quilting or fiber art. Karen? Absolutely, Mary. Thank you. Mary is really, tell us more about your storytelling because I know you're part of the Washinaji Quilting. Guild yes. here in Denver and tell us a little bit about their unique history to Denver, even though folks are members from all over the country. That's right. I'm a member of the Rocky Mountain Washinaji Quilt Guild. We have our meetings here at the Blair Caldwell African American Research Library. Of course, right now, our meetings are held on Zoom. Um, you can look, at us, look us up online as well. I have been a member since the early uh, 1990s. They were actually founded in the early 1990s by Helen Kearney, and it's an African-American quilt guild, but we welcome all who wants to come and join us. You may come and visit us also, so look us up online. Washinaji is a term that means people who sew. So we get together, we have members who are new members who are beginning quilters and we have master quilters. And um, we really build a sense of community and we travel around the state giving trunk shows and um, demos from the art museum to other guilds to the library. Every year we have our exhibit at the Blair Caldwell um, it builds us up because something about quilters coming together and quilting together and having um, the same desire, you know, the same thing about fiber arts, it's empowering. You can come together, you can talk through stuff, talk about stuff, whatever, and it's just a community of friends and talents and we bounce off things with one another. We teach each other. Washinaji's motto is each one teach one. So even if you would like to come and visit or if you want to come and learn, contact me or Washinaji because we'd love to introduce you to quilting. And I want to let all our audience know that we have an incredible packet of information with the bios of our artists as well as resources. So don't worry, you're gonna have a lot of information going forward. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Mary. You're welcome. See you soon. All right. Hello, Trisha. Good morning. Good morning. 
Uh, so my background, I'll talk a little bit about what I do during the day versus what I do night and weekends. Because during the day, I'm very fortunate that I've worked in art and craft publishing for many years. So I have done many, many how-to craft books, how-to magazines, um, how-to video, all in fiber arts and art and all kinds of crafts. So I've been really, really fortunate to be in a position to teach people how to do things, inspire people how to do things, and that's what I get to do all day um, for a living and work with really, really incredible artists that have been very inspiring to me. And one of the things that I really love about that is being able to bring really great work out of other people and showcase the work that other people do and um, to help inspire other people to be makers and find their own voice in what they do. And then personally, I've always been a maker, always been an artist for as long as I can remember. And uh, I'm a textile artist in my personal time. And I, so I hand dye, screen print, hand paint with dye on fabric. Um, and that is just like, to me, fabric is, I'm obsessed with fabric. I'm obsessed with color. Um, I think going into the studio and making a big mess is really the best thing you could possibly do. Um, I love to sew and I love to just make whatever I can out of the fabric that I make. And there's something for me, like something really exciting about making the cloth itself. Um, now that I've gotten into doing that, like I, you know, I love a good fabric store, don't get me wrong. I can still go into a fabric store and see a million things that I want. But the idea that I can make my own fabric and then having it be really personal um, is really, really exciting to me and a very uh, organic and very emotional experience to me. Um, to be able to do that. So um, I try to find as much time to do that as possible. Obviously, it's always hard I, for any of you who are like, have a full time day job, and then are trying to do their personal passion nights and weekends, you know what that's like, like you're always trying to find as much time as possible to do that. But um, that is always the constant quest of just to keep going and to find as much time as you can to make sure that you're getting that personal, that personal expression out somewhere. Um, so yeah, that's kind of my story. And Trisha, how did you, I mean, I always have found that very interesting. How did you find your voice? I have said to many people, as I've been researching this session, that this is about not being create, creative, it's about creating. How can you start that blank canvas conversation? Uh, blank camp. Well, you know, it, <laughs> I am one of those people who believe that everybody's creative. And I think that it's just a matter of starting where you are. Like, you know, I've been fortunate enough to have formal training on a lot of things and also fortunate enough to be around a lot of artists. And that's also to me, like, if you want to be creative, just being around other creative people is incredibly inspiring. And that is a great way to just help you get started or to feel encouraged or to just feel that support um, and to just start with what you have. I mean, you don't need a lot of stuff. You don't need a studio. You don't need any of those things to be creative. You can find something that's in your house, I guarantee you right now, um, that you can start doing um, on your own or with your family. It's, it's not, the hardest part is just getting started. And then once you get started, It'll keep going. It'll take on a life of its own. How have you adjusted your work, if at all, during the pandemic? So the publishing company I work with, we, we do both books, magazines, well, not books anymore, magazines and digital. And obviously with everybody during the pandemic, everybody obviously went online. So we've been doing quite a bit of um, free content online, particularly on YouTube. Like we've been doing live drawing classes and live painting classes and just anything that people can do for free while they're home with their kids or by themselves to keep going and to feel like you're still creating with a group of people, even if it is virtually. Um, but you can still, it's like a perfect time to like learn new skills or to pick up a new thing. And so that's what we've really been focused on is really amping up what we're doing in the digital space so that people can 
still feel that sense of artistic community, even if, you know, they're not able to do sort of all the in-person things or go to the bookstore like they used to, or, you know, access the stuff that we make in other ways. And that's been really powerful. I mean, it's been that connection, even if it's with total strangers online, it's been really meaningful for people. Um, and to feel like, you know, they can have, they can share their work, they can talk to each other, and they can learn how to do something new during this time. So. Very cool. Yeah. Well, I know I'll see you shortly, so I'm going to move on to last but not least, Kim. Good morning, Kim. Good morning, folks. Um, my name is Kim Sherubin. It's so good to see you. My pronouns are she, her, hers, and I'm sitting in Denver, Colorado. Um, yeah, I guess I'll, I'll round out the crew. Everyone uh, always says, hey, Kim, don't talk yourself down, but I, I'm going to call myself just a regular maker. <laughs> um, and I consider myself someone who, um, you know, for sure has that day job, night job kind of split, but I've always been a lifelong asker, learner, maker, sharer. And I think for me, what that means is that um, I am incredibly curious and I like to share that curiosity with people. So um, day job wise, I work in IT, you know, I'm an instructional designer, um, but ever since I was at least in high school, you know, I've made zines with friends. I have been deconstructing my own clothing to make it my own. Um, and I think a lot of that comes from my background. I'm Haitian American, so I'm first generation. Um, my parents came here in the 80s and um, it's been really interesting to kind of navigate life as a black woman um, and kind of delve into the deeper aspects of my diaspora history and kind of make sure that folks know that my roots um, are definitely collect connected to black America, but also have a deep, deep heart outside of Black America. Um, I just love the creativity of Black folks around the world, and I love that everything that we're even seeing on the screen harkens back to some of our roots um, across the world. And I think for me, what I try to remember is, um, you know, a lot, a lot of what uh, Kiona and Mary and Trisha have said is true. You don't have to start with this huge education. You don't have to start with this huge budget. You don't have to start with this huge craft room. Um, you know, I taught myself to uh, fiber arts wise, I taught myself to crochet um, because I, you know, had gone to college and I was really bored and I'm an introvert and I was like, I don't really want to go drink and hang out with these people. So I'm just going to go to the library. And one day in the library, I happened to find a crocheting book. There was a Michael's craft store right next door. And I said, oh, I've got a lunch hour. Let me teach myself to, to crochet. <laughs> and that's kind of how it all started. And um I think for me, a lot of what I wanted to share with this space is, you know, I, we all are very multifaceted. Um, and one of the things about me that might not be apparent is that I'm a huge introvert. <laughs> um, but everything that has come to me that is good in my life has been driven by a passion for my crea creativity and uh, curiosity. And that pushes you out, right? So it makes you talk to people, it makes you ask questions, it makes you say, hey, I'm gonna walk into the fiber store, fabric store, craft store, not knowing what I'm doing, but the passion is driving me to ask these questions. The passion is asking me to claim my space here and say it doesn't matter that not a ton of folks in the store look like me um, or that the folks in the store don't expect folks like me. This is what I love and this is why I'm here. And that has always um, kind of kept me going. Um, some of the photos that you're seeing here are, you know, that passion always drives me to do different things. Um, yeah, second from the left. Um, would that be the, I'm just like keeping an eye on the chat. So what we're seeing is um, I currently, my, my latest passion, because I kind of collect them, is um, I have studied to be an herbalist. Um, so I make and offer a lot of different herbal things, but that passion was very similar to the passion for making. I actually moved to Denver because of my passion for fiber arts. Um, and what we're seeing is a collection of, you know, I made my sister a huge, what's called chuppa. Her husband is Jewish American. So um, I knit and designed and had someone die and beaded a huge covering for their wedding ceremony um, that took me nine months to knit. And, you know, what we're seeing is kind of like the drawing up of that pattern and the math. Um, and a lot of that comes from my engineering background. Like I went to engineering high school. So it, it all kind of feeds together. And I think for me, what I want to share is that there's 
you know, I'm very privileged in that I have a lot of free time. I don't have kids. I have a job, <laughs> like all of the things. But I feel like even if I did have other constraints, you can start as small as you want, right? So um, there's a picture of some hand knit socks that I made for my mother-in-law that literally has no pattern. You just kind of knit in a circle and they fit everyone no matter what. And it takes, you know, a month to knit if you do it a little bit at a time. So I think for me, accessibility is big. Um, you know, the passion is big. And even if you don't have a community to work with, I, I'm really blessed now that I know a lot of folks who craft. But when I started, I, like I said, it was on a lunch break in the middle of college. No one wanted to talk to the girl who was knitting and crocheting. <laughs> and it was okay because I was so immersed in that world. For me, it's a lot of the meditation. It's a lot of the math. It's a lot of the repetition. It's a lot of the getting out of your head and, and not worrying about the worries of the day. And just, you know, it's a form of meditation. Um, it's been proven. Um, so I think that's kind of where I, I bring it all together, just really from the passion aspect and wanting to share because of the curiosity. And Kim, I love that you shared the fact that you have an engineering background. For those who think knitting is just for folks who are artists, that there is a lot of mathematics when you start in design. Would you just elaborate on that some? Yeah, I think for me, and it's, it's kind of the imposter syndrome, if, if you folks are familiar with that um, concept, you know, I, I, I and I, I forgot to mention this in my bio, I, I, I mentioned the Haitian American aspect because like my family came here to get things done. <laughs> so we weren't going to be the people who were like, oh, you can be an actress, you know, not, not knocking that down, but like our, Im you know, immigrant assimilationist mentality was not there to have room for creativity. So it felt like a huge blessing for me and my family to start an engineering high school, um, started college for engineering. And I just figured it wasn't for me for a lot of different reasons. And then I turned right back around and started doing things that made me do calculations. I had my spreadsheets for my, my, my knit stitches. You know, I had to calculate how much yarn I needed. Um, and it doesn't have to always get that intense, but it was a really nice way for me to say, I have these skills and the world might want me to be an engineer. <laughs> I don't want to do that. So I'm still going to bring those skills and those interests into my hobbies and make it work. Um, yeah, it is sneaky math, yeah. <laughs> That is awesome. I should ask Jill, I think we have a lot. Do you want to stop? And are there some of the chat questions you'd like to share with us? Yeah, so there was a question um, early on. Someone asked about dyeing. It says, Mary Lassiter asks, do you teach fabric dyeing? Is that question for me? It's for Mary, and they addressed it to uh, Mary, but it's, Trisha, do you want to jump in? Yeah, it was to all panelists, but it's from Mary Axon. Do you yeah. teach fabric dyeing? So, huh. You know, I've never, I could. I haven't taught it to people in like the <coughs> studio, but I would love to, because I think dyeing is kind of, once you start doing it, it's pretty obsessive. <laughs> um, so I think if anybody is interested, um, Feel free to get in touch with me after. The, my textile studio is called Studio Blackbird, and I think there's contact information in the in the um, information that you guys receive. But yeah, if anybody wants to learn, I would love to teach people how to do it. Yes, I'll reach out to you. I have. Um at one time dyed all the fabrics for a particular quilt that I was making. And it's something that I really love to do. And I was just wondering if you were teaching. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. And I dyed yarn too. So anybody who wants to do that too. Okay. <laughs> Jill, you want to grab a couple more before I move forward? Because we I'm ahead of time, which is wonderful for me. <laughs> that, was, um, that was the one question and then, um, Kim, Mary also asked Kim, tell us about the picture from second left, but I believe. Okay, hold on, I'll go back. Mm -hmm. So no yeah, more help questions. Me because uh, I'm challenged. <laughs> Which photo, is it the cat, the socks, or the math, or the? <laughs> no, I think you answered it well. It's the one, the big green thing you're working on. For your sister. Yeah. Yes. So, so just like you, I'm literally knitting right now because uh, what is it, the devil? idle hands, devil's placing, whatever, right. whatever. <laughs> um, yeah, that was, that was a really fun project. I actually, um, Patricia's point, I was like, maybe I'll show you guys spinning. I, 
one of the things I forgot to talk about is like, there's always more to learn and you can always go as deep as you want. So I literally started by going to Michael's, buying some really dope acrylic scratchy yarn. And I have now progressed to the point where like I spin my own fiber. Um, you know, I knit my own things. I have a knitting machine. I would love to learn to dye things. Um, but you can always go deeper because this is like one of the oldest crafts ever textiles and when you realize that the fabric that you're wearing even the the, the, the woven fabrics it, it's literally strained just piece by piece um twisted together and that that literally forms the fiber of everything that we wear it's a little bit mind-blowing and when you start making it it just it feels really good to connect to something so physical especially for people who might work in information working fields where you're like i just do data all day it, it's just really nice to actually hold something that you made and let alone to give it to someone and, and it becomes an heirloom. Mary knows what I'm talking about. These, the these Ben quilts and all these things that kind of have this beautiful long history and you can see it. You know, I, I just love that aspect of it. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so um, Amy would love, oh, Amy stated that she would love to learn to dye also. And then we have a question. Um, it says, does Trisha sell her dyed fabric and yarn? Uh, I do. Yeah, I do, you know, and I collaborate with people to do, you know, one-off stuff for whatever mm -hmm. project. Like, I collaborate with a woodworking friend of mine to do lampshades, and we make lamps together. I've done a lot of other collaborations with people, so I can do both custom stuff and just stuff that I make. So, yeah, feel free to reach out. Thank you. Thanks for asking. Absolutely. And Jill, I'm going to move forward and then we're going to bring all the panelists back together. Wonderful. Okay, we're going to get connected and thank you, Kian, for these wonderful photos of your team at the Yarn Mission. So, what's your story? Until the lion has his or her own storyteller, the hunter will always have the best part of the story. So we're getting ready to tell some more stories this morning. All our panelists, you are welcome back in to show yourselves. <laughs> Would you like us to speak on the question? Absolutely. <laughs> I, I'm sitting here playing with how many versions I'm not gonna see you all. There we go, now I see everybody too. Perfect, you're all here. Thank you. So yeah, and this, the, in the nature of the question, it, pardon me for stepping over you, this is talking about the social connections and how important you all have spoken to that. And during COVID-19 pandemic, the shutdown has really impacted us all, as I've mentioned, and you've mentioned also. But in spite of that, we have found ways to go forward. So you all can answer. This is truly an open discussion conversation. You all are going to riff off each other. I have a series of questions but you all get to guide the discussion. So that's just my first prompt. Who wants I, I guess I, I, can, I can kick us off. Um, you know, I mentioned that I, I'm an introvert. Can you guys hear me? Yeah. Yes. Okay, cool. Um, so I mentioned that I'm an introvert and it's really interesting because um, little known fact, Trisha is actually part of the reason that, I, that I'm in Denver. Uh, we used to work together. Um, and what we're looking at on screen for me is, is just one of the ways that um, art has created connections for the community. That's a, that's a great photo of, of my sister, Steffi, and her husband, Kyle, at their wedding, um, where you can see the, the, like, just the span of the chuppah. And for, for me, that was one of the first times that my family got to see what Weird Kim <laughs> actually does. <laughs> like I said, I've always kind of um, been creative and, and for me, it has, like I said, not forced me, but driven me. You know, I, I'm, a, so I'm a tourist, so I'm happy to stay home and be comfortable by myself with my husband and my cat, my dog, you know, um, but it's not until you start making things and, and asking questions or talking to people about them that you find that community. And now I feel a little bit more like an ambivert because Again, that passion just kind of drives me to make connections with people, find the information that I need. Um, and I've never been someone who is afraid to say, I have just as much right to be here. So 
we'll figure out any kind of sensitivity around you not expecting me or you having questions. Um, but, you know, I'm going to claim my right to make things because that for me is, is the driving passion. So I, I'd love to hear how other folks kind of make community happen. It's been harder for me because of COVID because I kind of fall back into my introvert ways. Um, but yeah. Now, I know, Mary, you invited me to one of your wonderful guild meetings earlier this month. And so you want to share how folks can like dive into the to the guild and just drop in and learn more. And that's another way to develop that community. Certainly. And develop a new habit. <laughs> yes, yes. And I want to encourage anybody who wants to learn about the quilting, just call me and let me know because I believe that once you start, you're gonna really like it. And Rocky Mountain Washinaji, we would meet once a month. And one of the things I miss most is our coming together. Yeah, I miss catching up with one another, seeing what they have created through show and share, sharing what I have to offer with them. And it's very, very precious. Something about creating mementos from your own two hands is so satisfying. It really comes from uh, the heart and comes from the soul. And it doesn't matter how simple or how elaborate, it's just making something with your hands and creating something that you know is so unique. You all are all welcome to come. Just look them up online. Another thing about my sense of community is, since the quarantine, yes, I have had to look out and find other guilds and other opportunities to learn certain techniques and just to hear artists' talks. There's um, a series of what's called textile talks that you can look up online, and they have different artists from different genres that you can just sit and hear their stories. It's about telling our stories. Every quilt has a story, no matter whether it's a simple quilt, you know, the fabrics in there might speak to you. That's why you made the quilt or something more elaborate with lots of embellishments and um, photos even, where there's a t-shirt quilt, you can tell your story about those t-shirts, um, genealogical quilts, you can talk about your family history through those, black history, social justice, Black Lives Matter, whatever you, know, you feel that you want to say, say what you want to say through your hands, your handwork, your personal stories. Um, I am so glad now for Zoom. I have to admit, when we were forced to be quarantined, it was just not me in any way. So many things from my colleagues on my job, to my church activities, to the guild, I couldn't participate. It felt so alienating. That's the best word I can say. But with Zoom, we can at least see one another's faces, catch up with our voices, encourage one another and say, hey, how you doing? And also there's a few things like I've continued to do my comfort quilting where we can just socially distance and I can deliver a comfort quilt. So yeah, I don't think we're gonna find a way to connect because Eric, we, tell you me know, more that's about the comfort are. quilt. Tell me more about the comfort quilt. And I apologize, I had a disturbance in the force, so I had to re reload, so sorry about that. Tell me about the comfort quilt. What does I that entail? Our guild has been doing comfort quilts, I believe, since its inception. And every year during your birthday month, members make a comfort quilt. I have also made lots of comfort, comfort quilts for my neighbors, you know. And comfort quilts are those things that you create and it's a whole quilt. And you give it to someone who has lost a loved one or who has been very ill. We have done comfort quilts for um, lots of lots of different 
things, but basically it's something that we give to someone so that they can wrap themselves in something and we're sharing our love for them through a quilt. And um, it's very precious to be able to just give back in that way. We've done things like those who had suffered um, in the fires in California, we made comfort quilts for them. There's other organizations that we've done the same thing um, and just sent many quilts so that they would be comforted, you know. So. Wow, that's amazing, amazing. Tell us about the one behind you. It's just not fair. Oh, <laughs> this one here that's behind me is um, from the book of Isaiah. It's called Trees of Righteousness. The technique is called Brodery Purse. And I also have what is called Trapunto. And it is appliqued. It was a quilt that I made for my mother. The entire wording is on the back. When you create your creations, be sure to document it with a label so people down the road will know you were here and you created that piece. See, this whole label talks about the quilt and the design is Jacobian. I love Jacobian flowers. They're kind of fussy. They're kind of, um, they're just unique. It's not like just looking at the rose. And um, so I did that. And then it is stippled, which is a quilting technique. So, wow. mm -hmm. so I've taught on Brodery Purse, machine oh quilting, those types of techniques. They're all, there's so many ways that you can create a quilt. It doesn't just have to be patchwork, even though I truly appreciate patchwork. My goodness, that is really beautiful. Absolutely. May I say a little thing about the one that's on the screen? Oh, oh yes. Just a little bit. That oh is my gosh. <laughs> a pine, that's a pine burr quilt. And I have been smitten with this. So I'm creating another one. I'm just saying, you take these little squares, fold them into triangles and stitch, stitch, stitch to your heart's content. But this is created by Loretta Petway. And there's a lot of information out there about the freedom quilting bees that you can look up online. It became the Alabama State quilt block. This is a, a, a sister who has for generations cre created this particular type of quilting and she has quite a history as well. Um, her mother taught her how to do it and um, just look up Alabama state quilt block. I don't think Colorado has one but I'm just real excited about it because someone saw it recognized it, honored it, was fascinated with it, and that's how far it went. So I, I made it was this amazing. for an exhibit. Mm -hmm. Wow. And apparently, how much does it weigh? That's the thing they were saying when I did some <laughs> research on it, that, you know, all this fabric, it is not a light quilt. This is not something you, that you necessarily would put on your bed either. At least I wouldn't. Not my right. bed. I'd probably ruin it. You're right. This one here is only 12 and a half by 12 and a half. It was for an exhibit. But a quilt like this would weigh so much. I don't know if you've heard of weighted quilts for those who, and they're supposed to help you just fall asleep easier because you feel the weight. But I would not sleep under one of these because it is extremely heavy. It could weigh, let's say 25 pounds even. You know, if you made a bed sized pine burr, they are very heavy. And the heaviness is not only the layers and layers and layers of fabric, but then when you put batting in the middle as well, yeah, it's very heavy. <laughs> it is amazing, absolutely amazing. Patricia, I just love these sheets that yeah. we, we decided to use all our artists since it's such amazing examples, it was hard to figure out what to select, but definitely tell us more about these bed sheets and this wonderful custom work that you do. And, 
the inspiration. I know we like purple, so that's that's an easy one. Um, but tell me more. Tell us more too. This was actually part of a collaborative, um, some collaborative work that I did. When I mentioned that I had worked with a good friend of mine that's a furniture designer, and we did like a joint show together. And he designed a bed, and I made um, custom painted um, duvet covers and. and pillowcases and just to that sort of echo the design and I think it's for me it's like actually really fun to collaborate with people who do something completely different from me um, as a way to kind of push myself and you know combine two things that you know aren't usually thought of the you know kind of playing off of each other um, but I love to make stuff like that for um, for the home I love to make clothes Recently, I have um, started getting into making dolls, um, and I was really thinking a lot about what Mary was saying about the whole thing of being able to give something to somebody. I had started, I've been in this space where I've been wanting to use up a lot of my fabric scraps, because I do tons and tons and tons of just fabric experimentation on pieces of fabric, like trying to work out patterns or just testing new ideas, and so I have a lot of just like pieces of fabric that like I might have tried something when I've just been sampling. And so I've been wanting to figure out like, okay, I have all these pieces, like what can I do with them? And I've started making these fabric dolls, which originally for me was a way to kind of work through some of my, work out some of my stuff about being so isolated and also about how I was feeling around all the Black Lives Matter stuff that was like getting me very worked up. And I started making these dolls like kind of in the tradition of sort of like any kind of like amulet dolls or, you know, not, not so much voodoo dolls, but like dolls where they sort of can hold your feelings or if you've ever heard of like nightmare dolls or like dolls that you can kind of take something that you're feeling and sort of like put it into the doll. And um, I was using it as a way to um, write down things that I was feeling and I would write down something that was meaningful to me or some feeling that I needed to get out of me and I would put it inside the doll. And I've also recently, I had a friend who just had a baby um, in uh, November and it's not an easy time to like have gone through a pregnancy and kind of, you know, didn't have sort of the normal, you know, baby shower and all the stuff that you would normally have around having a new baby and being around. And I had um, asked her to write down something for her baby daughter that she wanted her to know and to give me a piece of fabric that was meaningful to her. And I made a doll for her baby girl. And it was just like a really meaningful thing for me to do for her and something that, um, I felt like, you know, I, my grandmother made me rag dolls when I was a kid. And I, I just know how meaningful that was for me to keep that and to just have something that felt like you could keep and give to your kid or the next kid. Um, and I, you know, just using scraps of my fabric and it just, that was like something that just meant something to me and was a great way to connect with somebody in a way that like, I don't know if I would have thought of doing something like that if it wasn't for just coming out of the, you know, everything that's been happening in the last year, I'm not sure that was a form of expression that would have happened otherwise. Um, but yeah. That is someone asked if you had one near that you could show. <laughs> that's what I should have, they're all. I was like, highlight that question. <laughs> and you're moving, I know you're moving, but did you at I least know. leave one out? <laughs> studio and so yeah they're all just like one of a kind you know just sort of quirky yeah they're all just are they on your website by the way do you have at least one on your website uh I don't but I will put some up I will put some there up I, they've been like just like a little bit of a personal project and now they're starting to I want to make a lot of them but it's been a good I don't know a good like emotional outlet for me in this really interesting way and there's something about I don't know writing something down and like getting it out of you and like I don't know it's like nice to have these little people that sort of you know they carry it um so yeah I mean but yes I, I put some pictures up 
I, I oh, love yeah. that part of making because it's, you know, even if it's something personal that starts with you, once you start talking about it, it just has a life of its own. And literally that's how I've made some of the best friends of my life, the best career decisions of my life. Like it, it, it starts in you and you, it cannot stay in. And, you know, just thinking about that question of community, even if you're not someone who traditionally seeks out community, it, it finds you because it, it, it can't stay in you. And, you know, I'm going to use that other leaping off point, that using that passion, how to work with different generations, the whole intergenerational aspect. I know, Kiana, through the Yarn Mission, by definition, you have, you interact with folks of all different ages. And so do you, Mary. How can we stimulate other folks of different ages? Doesn't have to be young of any age, who's young at heart, who wants to just, like, Mary made me want to do this, and Trisha made me want to do that, and then Kim. How can we encourage them? How would you suggest they jump in? Well, one of the ways that I like to do it is I am so passionate about the quilting. And so when I do have opportunity and gather around young people, which we, I've had a lot of opportunity to do that, for some reason, young children, they just, I feed off of their energy and their curiosity and their innocence in teaching them about the quilting. There's the eagerness that they have to learn how to really thread that needle and put those pieces together and plan out their blocks. And also, you know, they need to use math, of course. So it's a great teaching tool but it is also so rewarding to see that they finish something. That finishing is so satisfying. Many quilters will tell you, oh, I have whips and I have PhDs and I have UFOs. That's works in progress or projects half done or unfinished objects. But the satisfaction of actually completing a piece of something that you made and when they show me what they made and the, how happy they are and lit up they are, I it's just you have to share your own passion. I probably would not get that same feeling and bounce off and back and forth had it not been if I was trying to teach something that I don't normally teach, like painting or something of that nature. But I know the quilting and that's something that I love to impart that knowledge to the children. And then elders, I want anyone who would like to learn to do that. It's never too late to learn a new skill. And if you just try it and you find that you like it, then you can progress, learn more and more about it, do more with it, and those types of things. I love all of that, and it resonates so deeply. Um, I wanted to share, like resonate off of the, some things that have already come up to that um, our arts connect us with those who come before us, right? And who still like come through us. Um, and so I think in terms of it connecting with community and connecting with generations, just our involvement with the art does that. But then to think about, um, I love the story aspect. Right. And I think a lot of us, as we recognize, like, especially if we do any kind of like, if we do carry our art with us, people want to engage with us and with what we're doing. Right. And like, sometimes this is like, okay, people deserve space, but sometimes this is a, okay, you know, I want to know your story. I want to share my story kind of thing. And so, um, I mean, we find uh, people are connected to art. People have vast connections to art in their families. Whether or not they picked it up already or not, they can feel that connection. Um, and so for me, it's about opening the space for it to happen. Um, and so, and I think this is true for across the generations is uh, one of the things that um, we especially got to do a lot in um, Minnesota was, um, just to go and set up a booth at like a block party and stuff. And then folks just come through and then all of a sudden they're, 
there are kids who are like, oh my goodness, I've been wanting to learn how to knit. I've been telling my parents, you know, and I'm just so excited and they're dragging people and stuff. Um, and there are people who are like, oh, my mom always wanted to teach me, but I just wasn't ready. And now I would like to be in this space. I'd like to just feel it. I'd like to just have that connection. And so um, for me, it's about making that space just to welcome people who want to come. The pictures that you showed um, of some of our gatherings, like we're very intentional about being out in public in spaces that we want to be in, spaces that matter to us. And then we just can welcome people to sit with us. Like it's not a, we're not sitting there like, oh, we'll come back in four weeks or, you know, go and set up this appointment. We're like, uh, well, you're here now. Like, look at these needles. Here you go. Just touch them. Just see how it feels. Um, and so we're, we're really about opening space. Um, we do it intentionally as well and having the boots of different things. We've done school programs specifically to welcome kids who wanna try it and they get to move in and out as they wish. And we really are intentional about being responsive to where people are um, and how they might move through knitting to make it kind of a most, the most welcoming process as we can. Um, one of my favorite things though that I get to see is when we've um, been able to be part of a space being built where you can see the generations learning and teaching together in that space, right? So like maybe I'm teaching a parent and that parent is directly translating to a child. Um, it, it's just like a really exciting and beautiful thing. Mm. Thank you. You all have been amazing. Panelists, do not leave me. But I know that there's a lot of chats going on, Jill. I'm not sure, but um, the floor is yours to um, open up the chat and or the question A for our panelists. Thank Could you. we start so, actually with someone asked us how we met. And I think talking about maybe the origin of the panel could be really exciting. Oh, I think that's wonderful. Um, let's see. I know I'm gonna leave you to the end, Kim, because that's easy. I reached out with this crazy idea to try to talk about social connectiveness and how we could get together with my supervisor, Amy. And I said, you know what? I need people who are passionate, who are just gonna really fill the screen and let people know we're not alone. The, all the wonderful mental and health benefits of all of this, you know, dementia reduction and so forth and so on is one side but let's talk about the passion and the fun and how we connect to our communities. So that's where that, that little nut started. And from there, she introduced me to Kim. And then from there, Kim, I'm gonna hold on again because Kim made introductions to Kiona and Trisha. And then Mary came about because one of my team members mentioned, you know, they've got this guild going on in Park Hill. Did you know about them? Thank you, Giselle. I went, no, I did not. So it was very organic how all this information came to myself. And so Kim, thank you for just bringing in your friends. I, I, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna plug yet another friend of mine. It's, again, I, I, I kind of keep saying I'm an introvert, but then I prove myself otherwise. It's, um, I, I kind of almost am piggybacking to the intergenerational conversation because I think for me, it was my generation that brought fiber back to my family because, you know, when I started knitting and crocheting, my mom was like, how much did it cost you to make that sweater versus just going and buying one? And I, I, I told her and she was like, I don't think I came to this country so that you could spend three times as much time-wise and money-wise. But, you know, when you do things that you love and you're passionate about, it shows in your life. And I've been doing this since I was a kid. And she sees, hey, you are the calmest of my children. You know, you are the most like you have your stresses like everyone else but like the work shows itself in your life you know so when Trisha's saying you know I had these feelings to get out and I wanted to share them when Mary's saying I want these I, I see that the young kids faces light up when they when they hear about like I've always wanted to make this stuff when Kiona says hey we're out on the street we're knitting you want to join like it, it shows through your own life so don't feel like it has to be more or less than so i'm just really excited to be connected to all of you folks and mary i i, I also have quilted <laughs> so we're probably gonna hit you back up but um there's a really great exhibit in town um it's at the mca and it just brings together so many facets of blackness 
showing that while we have so much in common, um, we are also so multifaceted and everyone that you see at that exhibit um, just has so many uh, facets to their personality. And, you know, creating is just one of them. Music is just one of them. Spirituality is just one of them. And I'm just really glad to be connected to even folks who are participating. Um, and I, I hope to see some of you guys that there's a lot of events. Um, and I think Karen's going to speak to some of the opportunities a little bit later, but there's a lot of ways to be in connection and community with people in your own time, in your own space, and you don't have to jump in all right away. You know, these things happen over time. I could not have planned that I would have been on this panel, but being here, I'm like, oh, it totally makes sense that this happened, <laughs> you know? So thank you guys. Absolutely. More chat or Q&A questions. All right. So I don't see any questions, but... Um... Someone said, I finally started delving into quilting last year. My attempts at building a social life in Colorado looked like finding sewing time. Sewing yeah, time. I was sharing that because uh, um, I was like, okay, got to build a social life. This was obviously in the before times, right? And I'm like, well, how do I build a social life in kind of the way that my life is structured? And I was like, sew times? And I was like, okay, that seems right. That seems like what someone, you know, does. Um, and so I'm so excited uh, to be learning more about uh, the Washinagi Guild and all of the, all of the things that y'all do. Um, thinking about community, right? Like we, one of the big things that I talk about around the yarn mission is that we're already community. We're already in community. We're already like connected, but like being able to let us all know that is something that I'm really committed to. So I appreciate all of this and the ways that it demonstrates that. I think it, a lot of things model the things that we already can feel. I, I have a question for the participants and the panelists. I'm just, I always, the first question you ask when you go to a, a stitch and bitch or a knit night or whatever, it's like, what are you working on? So, you know, what are people working on things through the pandemic or what's exciting to you? What have you learned technique wise or a book that you saw? Like inspiration comes from everywhere. So I'm just curious what folks in the, in the chat and the panelists are actually thinking about working on or are currently excited about. Um, myself, I'm working on two pieces. Our guilds um, exhibit will be in August through September. We're gonna go ahead and have the exhibit, even though it's gonna be virtual. And one of the pieces is called Faces. We've been challenged each to make faces. I'm working on that. And the second one is our theme this year is, um, things ain't what they used to be. It's a Duke Ellington song, but you mm -hmm. can see that can go the gamut. We could talk about electronics, we could talk about our families, we can talk about health, we could talk about whatever we want to, but that's the theme. And those are the two pieces that I'm really working on right now. I have actually been continuing on with my using up scraps of fabric and getting into quilting actually, or making wall hangings um, and doing, I love to do hand work, like hand embroidery, hand stitching, other types of, you know, that for me is very meditative. Um, so I have been working on these just sort of very um, organic free piece kind of wall pieces that have been really fun to work on. I love working on stuff that doesn't require any kind of pattern. It's, there's no plan, it just kind of comes together very organically. Um, and so that's been what's getting me very excited right now. Um, I went through this process where like in the beginning of the now times, right? People were like, ooh, I'm gonna finish all these current projects and you know, I'm gonna get these things out of my queue. And I was like stressed, right? Cause I was like, okay, here's this project. I'm like, oh, who, it's all so many year long projects, right? And I was like, I don't wanna do this. And I was like, I'm not going to, I'm gonna, that's just, that's not a now. That's not what I'm like, we've got enough to be navigating rather than me putting my own stress onto myself. And so um, I did like, I went through and I, I kind of sorted through what, what spoke to my, like what spoke to me in pleasure, right? Thinking about Audre Lorde, what was my, spoke to my erotic. 
And so I was like, well, um, I dabbled in um, socks again. And so I was like, okay, let's do that. And um, been trying to convince, like figure out what things the baby might want. And uh, my, my baby is not a baby, but he is three, um, but he is my baby. And uh, he calls things yarn stuff. So he's like, ooh, I, I want, me want a yarn sweater. Ooh, me want yarn socks. And so um, I can make him these things, but he says, um, me really like it, but I don't want to wear them right now, which is fine. He's just going to have a huge cute things that he really likes, but doesn't want to wear right now. And he'll still make requests. So connecting with him though, through the making and the art and letting him see the different yarns and everything is a really fun thing that we do together. Um, and then, I mean, I took a dyeing class. I just like do as I can with what feels right in any moment. Um, but also remembering to give myself grace. My, like, my passions and my arts aren't supposed to stress me. So I was like, yeah, no, like, they, they'll get their day. It doesn't have to be at the now time, or they won't, you know, like, that's all, all those things are fine by me. So, um, and a, I think a big part is just being able to, um, thinking about uh, the way Kim talks about like kind of our social affinities and stuff. Um, I love to watch the community. I do so through Instagram, even though I'd love to not be on platforms, but I also love to watch. Um, and it's just been really nice to be able to have that space to see what's going on too. Um, even as I'm like, you know, I just mentioned I have a three-year-old, so my hands are occupied a lot, but uh, there's a lot of ways for me to still feel part of and connected to um, that resonate throughout my um, more occupied moments. All right, Kim, you asked the question. What about you? I was going to say, Karen, don't, and I don't know if you're on the makes, but I see you in the corner. Uh, so Karen, I will, I will let you go after me, but... Um, what was I going to say? Kiana hit it on the head. You know, for, for me, I have a day job. <laughs> so if this is supposed to be fun, the moment I'm like stressed about it, I stop. So I used to do a podcast and that got crazy because I was like, I have to put out an episode and I have to buy this yarn because people are talking about it. And it's, I stopped because it wasn't fun anymore. But I currently am literally knitting two different sweaters. But the thing that I'm most excited about um, is I, I, like I said, I spin wool. So this is just a small um small demo but like this is just the most magical thing to me that you pull and then it becomes yarn so I currently probably after I finish um you know knitting for the day I'm gonna just, just be doing this um so I'm gonna be is that a drop a spindle bit. it is a Turkish drop spindle and when Mary was telling all of her little uh terminologies I was like that's why I love makers because we have our own language you know there's different kind of spindles, different kind of techniques, different kind of ways to draft and draw. And I'm sure, you know, Trisha could tell us about different dyeing techniques and Keona could tell us about different like pattern making techniques that you can geek out about so much of it um, that I feel like that's one of the things I love. You know, you don't have to be a, a good conversationalist. All you have to do is be willing to ask a question like, tell me more, tell me more, tell me more. So um, yeah, that's, that's what I'm currently working on is, is three different things. <laughs> How about you, Karen? <laughs> You were kind to ask. I, you know, I was in your space. Um, I'm one of those people who start a project and I finish a project or it gets ripped out, which is better known as froggy. And so I knit a few things for my nieces and my great niece, which I finished. And then I wanted to start something for all about me. And so I was thinking of the comfort quilts. I did a comfort card again. It's, a, there's enough room for more than one person but it's big and it just loves you and I probably will never wear it except for outside because it's really super heavy but that was my project so my next project is actually it's going to be do a mosaic hat which is basically it's it's complicated because I'm in a better headspace I could do the math I could do the concentrating the daylight hours are upon us so that's my next project which will be absolutely I can't wait to get started because I have to uh, do some, what they call swatching, making examples to figure out what I'm going to do next. Definitely. Well, this has been fun. Do we have any more questions, Jill, before I carry on or? Um, no, no questions, but I did, Joanne um, put in the chat that Dr. Carolyn Ma Maslumi 
Um, look her up because she has many quilts exhibits on social justice, one currently in Minneapolis. So that really. I know you're going to save the chat for us so we can figure out how we can share that on our Facebook page in case we forget anything, because I'm sure it's not in my packet that we put together. So panelists, don't leave, don't leave, but I'm just going to go past our question area. It's poll time. Can you imagine that? We're back to polls. Sorry about that. After this very, I enjoyed conversation, if um, just to take a, just see how you're feeling right now after being with us for almost 90 minutes. I know a minute's a long time to wait, but has everyone put in their responses who, who wanted to? Thank you for showing us the poll. Ooh, I'm loving it. We've moved up. I feel good. Have the capacity to share my gifts. And we've managed to move some folks from what was the three I look fly on the outside We've moved closer to feeling better. We are so happy that you feel better today. And we wanna keep that going for you. So thank you for hiding the poll results. And because we're not gonna get you all excited and without making an offer to you. Come on, Rashid. I've been idle so long. Come on. Technology is not going to fail me now. Okay. Yay. There we go. Sorry about that. We are so fortunate. Fancy Tigers is a incredible craft, yarn, everything, fiber shop here in Denver. They are offering complimentary craft classes that are reserved exclusively for attendees of the Black Health Lives Matters Summit. Hmm. Actually, the Black, the virtual Black Health Summit. The feelings there, availability is limited. So how this is going to work, because there are classes, they're offering knitting 101 and crochet 101 classes that in the packet that I referenced earlier, and also Jill will drop into the chat. If you go to this link, if you click on that, and then put into the discount code Black Health Matters, you will not be charged for the classes, which will be held in early to mid-March. And to let you know, this also includes the materials so if you're here in the Denver metro area, you can give them a call once you know you're in the class and say, hey, I'd like to come and pick up and they'll do a curbside pickup for you for one or, one or other of the classes. Or if you're out of the area or are not able to get down to them, we will make arrangements with them so that you get the materials shipped, which I think is a pretty, pretty incredible offer from them. So this is removing barriers. That's our whole goal behind this. And needless to say, Fancy Tigers has lots of online classes. This is just two of them that they made available to us today as a result of being here. Thank you to Golden Peak Media. And thank you specifically to Trisha, who mentioned what she does in her daytime job. They are offering five randomly selected winners the opportunity to choose a one-year subscription from any one of these three magazines. Interweave Knits, Sew News, or Fonz Porter's Love of Quilting. And the fact that you actually attended 
this session, you're automatically um, enrolled in that drawing. And so Trisha and or I will be reaching out to you to let them know who the winners are. Yep, as soon as uh, whoever Karen gets me the names, we'll all connect with whoever for those five people and get you guys signed up. Thank you, Trisha, and thank you, Fancy Tiger. Those are just incredible offers that we didn't expect, but gifts keep coming. And just to say, this is Shalav, and he's a professor of psychiatry at NYU School of Medicine. And he said in 2005 that reuniting people with their naturally occurring sources of support, like friends and family, is one of the most powerful interventions we can make. This is just an example of the packet that you'll be getting. It also includes the special offers that I went over just a moment ago. This is also something we wanna offer you as it pertains to your social and emotional well-being. This is called My Strength. It's a free application. Yes, it's an application that is available to you at any time, whether you're in Colorado or not. If you sign up between now and the end of June, it's still free and you have that access to that app indefinitely. And so it gives practical strategies such as parenting, relationship, stress, depression, anxiety, sleep challenges, substance use, grief and loss, and specifically looking at some of the coping skills that will be particularly pertinent during COVID-19 regarding create and setting goals and tracking your health. And again, it's free. You don't have to, um, again, sign up for it today. If you have your phone with you and you, you want to scan it, I'll give you a moment. You can scan it with your phone and you get, it'll pop up on your phone. Otherwise, again, it's in the packet. That's part of the session. So I'm going to wait in case someone wants to pull out their phone. Um, Joanne wanted to know if anyone on the if any of the panelists work at Fancy Tight Group. You know, I, I, just I, don't, I just chatted. I just I, chatted. I don't think any of us do, but I, I have taken, I'm literally wearing a skirt that I took a class from a woman of color who teaches garment making. So they, they have tons of classes and they're, they're one of my favorite shops um, here. So they're, they're very inclusive, very, very aware of that stuff. So they're a great space to visit. And I think they're opening back up for public shopping um, next week. So great resource. And to let you know that they are known not only in Colorado, but internationally as being allies, meaning that they are a shop that welcomes everybody, people of color, anybody and everybody is welcome. Thank you for that great question. Some more resources for folks in Colorado. We have a 24 hour crisis support line that I mentioned the very early days. And that again, this information is in the packet for you. Free and anonymous services, they do do walk-ins and it just depends on what COVID is doing. Right now, it seems like we're going more toward the opening zone here in Colorado. And to let you also know that there's a 24 hour national disaster distress line, again, free anonymous services. And these services specifically, this one is for national disasters and COVID is considered a national disaster. So this number is available all the time. We are coming to the close of our session. And I just, if you want to, this is another QR code, which you can use your phone for to scan. Otherwise, um, Jill will drop the link into the chat box that we just wanna know how we did today, how we can be better. This is our first time doing such an elaborate, uh, we've had two programs this weekend um, and just to improve what we do. And I'm going Diana, to welcome drop that, the link in uh -huh. the um, chat. Thank you, Diana, for dropping that in. What a team. It takes a team to put things on like this. And last but not least, I just want to thank all our panelists. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your passion. Thank you for helping us mend our social fabric. We hope that this in session has inspired you, our panelists, and our audience about how we're going to get back to making 
And this is just some information about myself. This is my email address. And also you can always call this phone number. It is our main number versus my personal cell number for work because um, that way I want to make sure to take care of you all. So this has been an amazing day. I thank you all. And I thank Jill for saving the chat for me because I don't want to ruin like I did last night, um, saving the chat. So um, thank you all. Be well, be safe. And Yolanda? All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. This was so amazing and wonderful. And as each of you spoke, I just thought of all the people I know who are makers. And I thought, oh, I should have told them about this. Oh, I'll have to tell them later. Oh, I have to say, do you know this person or that person? Um, and the smiles that you all have that reach from your very depths of your soul into your heart come out in your eyes as you speak about um, what is your passion? What makes you glow? What you could do if you were alone on an island with just the things that you need. And you know, it is important to know that sometimes um, how we are making things, that is the soul, the essence of those people that we love most. And that learning from those who came before us, the ancestors that say, here is my child reborn again, who is recreating the memory and history of our family, of our people. So thank you, thank you so much. And for those of you that have enjoyed this session as much as I have, please let us know. This is the first time that the Center for African American Health has done a virtual health summit. So we wanna know how we did. So make sure that you let us know, drop it in a chat, put it in a main chat. We just wanna know, did we help to make your day? Did we help to bring laughter and cheer to you? And again, thank you so very much. Thank you everybody, be safe.